Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Courtside with Beal and Tennis, part of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. It's an absolute privilege to have this former world number 14 on the men's ATP Tour, a three-time ATP Tour winner, a Wimbledon quarter finalist in 2000, and also a finalist at the 2001 Miami Open. He was known for his two-handed forehand and also his incredible fitness. Please welcome to the pod, Jan Michael Gamble. Jan Michael, thank you very much for spending time and uh, talking some tennis with Steve and I. Absolutely. Thanks, David. Appreciate it. Hey, um, I know you're going to be doing some commentating uh, for the French Open. Give us a quick snapshot of where you're currently at. Um, what's keeping you busy the next couple of days before you start doing the, the commentating? I know as of the data recording, the, the draw just came out earlier today. We're going to get to that in a little bit later. Yeah, well, I just came off. Of, I've been doing four days of, of the qualifying already. So we're, we've been covering events from uh, both Lyon and Geneva uh, for the men. And uh, um, uh, we're in Morocco and Strasbourg for the women. So covering all the events pr prior to this last week, it's sort of the, it's the road to Roland Garros. And I've been covering all the events leading up to it uh, with Tennis Channel. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, and obviously leading up to the Grand Slam and Tennis Channel has all the courts, has the entire entire slam. So we'll have a team there, some a team here. So we, we got it fully covered, which is uh, it's pretty great. But uh, you know, it's been a lot. It's been a lot of work uh, doing the night shift hours because tennis is in Europe. So we're broadcasting out of Santa Monica, and uh, you know it is what it is. You you get up and you, you get the energy, and it's, it's it's been a lot of fun. It's been fantastic. Tennis Rome was great. Madrid was great. Monte Carlo was awesome. So it's, it's just been, the road has been great. And it's just really exciting. First of all, seeing Alcaraz, he's, he's for me, uh, the most exciting player to come out, you know, for a long time. And I'm far enough removed now from the game. I think that I can appreciate an up and coming player again, but where before I was kind of, you know, would kind of shy away from it, you know, uh, after my career. And, and now I'm appreciating the game a lot more again, which is exciting. Um, and it's also amazing to see what Iga Shiantek has has accomplished. And, and, you know, those are my two favorites going into the French. Uh, it's kind of crazy maybe to pick a favorite in, in, in Alcaraz, you know, young guy. But uh, it's it's also very exciting. A hundred percent. And we've talked about both uh, Iga Shiantek and Carlos Alcaraz quite a bit uh, previously. And and Steve, in our year end segment at the end of what, what 2021, he said Alcaraz will be top 10. Recently, I asked Steve that same question again. He said, and Renee Stubbs, we had Renee on too, and they both said there's a chance he could be number one at the end of this year just because of ranking points. He doesn't have a lot of points to defend coming up. So That's a good point. I mean, he, he doesn't. You know, with Rafa having his foot being injured, that, that is something that we're all – everybody's, you know, the tennis world is watching, obviously – but let's not forget, if you're talking about the men, you know, Novak played unbelievable just last week and kind of crushed everybody. Um, and people are also kind of forgetting how well Sissipas and Zverev are playing. So I think that there's some people that will contend very well. And when you stretch to three out of five, that's a different deal. And, yeah. and you, you, got, you have these guys that know how to win the three out of five set, set matches. Um, and, and that's what's going to be very interesting, I think, for tennis fans, um, interesting for tennis professionals, everybody kind of watching this to see how, how that becomes a factor. Um, because no, nobody knows how to do it better than Rafa and Novak um, in these events. Yeah, no, yeah, I think you're a very good assessment, Jan Michael. One thing I would ask you, though, is don't you think that when it comes to that ranking, that it means more to Carlos at this stage? <laughs> Novak, he got, he's got his record number of weeks now. He's finished seven years at number one. And to me, his priorities are definitely to add more majors and he's going to pick and choose where he plays. But Carlos is like Rafa in 05. He's just going to keep playing and playing. And I think there's no way he doesn't win at least eight titles this year. And therefore, he's piling the points up. And, he, and even if he didn't win a major, he would still have a shot. He has a to chance. He does have a shot. I think he needs to do well at the majors. I think that that's oh, yeah. going to be a big deal. I think, yeah, you're right. Novak he's done it all obviously, but he's still hungry somehow. You know, you look at these, these great champions that we we're, we're just watching continue to pile on these amazing results. And somehow there's still that fire burning, which is, 
it's not something that our game has ever seen because these guys playing well into the 30s that's that's a new deal that's a new thing for you know yes. seeing serena play so long and seeing uh, these great champions uh, on the men's side as well play so long is navratilova did it but that was sort of an anomaly and we thought wow you know that's that's martina she's special you know jimmy sort of did it connor's a little bit you know played pretty pretty a lot longer than other players but then people were thinking you know i was on tour it was 30 years old was yeah 30 years old was <laughs> kind of like okay you know, better figure out what you're going to do you, you yeah. shift into coaching or commentary or you know move into something else in life and it's it's you know or maybe just retire if you're lucky enough to have done well enough on tour that's i think it's that's a hard thing because people like to do something and you get kind of accustomed to doing something so how amazing is it that people, these guys can continue to do what they love? And I don't think it's going to be easy to take that from Novak, especially, I mean, and then you have to, you also judge it also, if you're just talking about operas, Juan Carlos, smart guy. He, he knows that the guy needs to take some time off as well. So didn't play Rome, you know, goes yeah. out and wins Madrid. And <laughs> I mean, look at who he beat there. It's just it was ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, Rafa, Novak, <laughs> Zverev. I mean, and maybe Zverev didn't play great in the final, but crossed Zverev. So you think, well, maybe he should play Rome. They took it off. And and so they're making some really intelligent decisions. I think he's here for the long haul, not just to do it all this year. So, yeah, he could be number one this year. I think he has the tools. He's, he, he has been the best player in the world for, you know, the last little bit um, since the hardcourt season. Um, but... I think that their their goal is, is, is very much a long term one. So um, that's what makes him, you know, there's he's special for a lot of reasons, but the the the, the IQ of the tennis IQ and, and the coaching and the whole team around him is is already making the good decisions. Yeah, I, I want to we'll we'll get into more uh, some of the pro stuff and obviously your playing career and and how you got into coaching and broadcasting. But before we do that, I want to kind of take a step back because I know you and a bunch of other people uh, very influential in the tennis world are very involved in this new USTA, the, the SoCal pro circuit. And um, we all know how difficult and challenging it is. If, if you don't have a big backing behind you, whether it's family money or whether it's sponsors uh, to travel, especially on the futures tour, the challenger tour, you have to go all over the world at times. This, um, tries to make that a little bit easier. And I know it's coming up in a few weeks. If you don't mind, talk a little bit about um, what the SoCal Pro Circuit's all about and, and what's your role really with this initiative? Well, I'm on the Southern Cal um, board. So I get to hear a lot of the good things that have been my first year on it, which is uh, I, I remain fairly quiet on it this first year, trying to learn as much as I possibly can on you know, what makes everything sort of work behind the scenes. It's, it's, it's been fun because I've been in now kind of all parts of the tennis world and, and I'm privy to a lot of the good conversation that they're having and how hard SoCal is trying to, to help young players. And, uh, um, you know, Chris Boyer, you, you know, his son, Tristan Boyer, I, I worked with him, uh, coached him a little bit and helped him uh, sort of during the first part of, of COVID. And, you know, there was, we had a court we could train on and just, you know, trying to get some things done and, and seeing him just try to find tournaments to play. It's hard. And, you know, you lose tournaments because of, because of COVID, you lose tournaments because of other reasons, sponsors, whatever it might be. Um, so Chris Boyer had the idea to let's go out and let's create some more tournaments. And, and the board really kind of got behind him. Paul Anacone and Lindsey Davenport are behind him. He's got some really good people trying to help out and, and got it done. So, you know, created six tournaments. There's there's three in the L.A. area and three in San Diego. And it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity to just play a bunch of events. Um, the wild cards, it seems, are going to go to, you know, local local California, either if you're playing at a school, um, one of the California school, college school, you know, colleges or um, up and coming junior. Um, so there's opportunities for California residents and, and players to, to play these events, which is it's a fantastic idea. No, that's awesome. And again, uh, you, you got so many good players down there in California, just in California alone that it's going to be uh, easy as far as uh, they're really not going to have to travel that far at all. So um, anything to grow the game and help make it a little easier for people who are trying to make it um, because we yeah. all know how hard it is. So if you think about, uh, you think about when I was coming up, we had, we played the, the, the satellite tour and, mm -hmm. and I actually think we should go back to the satellite tour. I liked it. And I'll tell you why 
they put a lot of pressure on players to do well because you had to make do well enough in the first three to make it into the Masters event. So yep. I like the idea of that early pressure. I felt it. And when I transferred into the other parts of the tour, namely, I kind of skipped the challengers, which was luckily, it was a little bit different. You could play a lot of qualifying ATP events. That's where I wanted to be. So I played as much of that as possible as my ranking would allow. Um, and I already kind of felt like I'd seen a lot of pressure because of those moments where you just, you had to win, but you kind of got nothing out of it. Now these, it's not the same thing, but it's at least it's, and it's also an opportunity like the satellites where you could go to an area and be guaranteed four events in a very close. That's what I was going to say. The satellites yeah. were grouped. Those first three, four tournaments were, were in an area exactly. that was somewhat small. Exactly. Yeah. So you did, you could, you could sort of afford to stay and we were staying Sometimes we had an RV we used to travel in. So we traveled in the RV to Canada, to Edmonton. Those, can, those played those in it and traveled to California and played the ones here. Um, it, was, it was sort of an affordable kind of thing you could do. It's, it's hard. It's, it's expensive to travel, have a coach, travel around, try to play. All these things is, you know, have the right equipment, you know, is expensive. And so I think it's a really good opportunity for a similar type of a situation where you play these events in a close area maybe if you're local you can stay at home which is kind of amazing um you know and and not be so far out of pocket to play these events so it's there for you and and you know hopefully the players can get out there and, and make some good out of it yeah no i think it's a great initiative and again best of luck with with it and all the all the the, the, the men and women playing it, I think it's a great, great initiative and anything to help grow the game and, and make it a little bit easier. So thank you for your involvement with that. Staying on the West Coast, I mean, you grew up, you grew up in Spokane, right? Not too far from California, depending on where you're going in California. Um, curious a little bit here about your experiences on tour. I mean, you, you competed against the best of the U.S. generation, right? During your time, like the likes of Andre and Courier and Sampras and Chang. You also beat all of them at least once. Um, growing up in that area and then competing against them on the pro tour again. This was the best generation. We're 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 getting there again now. I'm not saying they're going to match the likes of of the names that we just mentioned, but we got a good young crop right now. Um, got a lot of momentum. But talk a little bit about uh, your experiences playing against those guys. Well, it was, it was, it was frankly amazing. I mean, my hero growing up was Jimmy Connors. And so, you know, that was the pre previous generation is Connors and Mac and, you know, all the great players of that generation, namely those two guys were my sort of inspirations, mainly Connors, but who doesn't like John McEnroe is an exciting guy to, to watch and uh, energize me to want to play tennis when I was a kid. Um, and then, you know, sort of getting through the juniors started to see these, other amazing champions is Courier and Agassi and Sampras. And, you know, they're starting to, to win these tournaments. And it was Jim kind of first that, that was energizing, you know, everybody. And who, who wasn't, you know, so impressed with the flair of Andre, you know, and, and, and sort of the intrigue that was there. So, uh, you know, growing up, all of a sudden I had opportunities. I, I was number one in the nation first year 18s and sort of caught the eye of, uh, you know, various USTA people and, and some opportunities came my way. One of them was to practice with, uh, with Jose Higueras, who was working with, with Jim Courier. And uh, at the time I was, I think I was, you know, I had committed fully to playing on tour and I was 300 or something, something in the world. And um, Jose, you know, we, we sort of hired him on the side and I, they allowed me to, to practice with Jim and, and all these players practicing in Palm Springs at Mission Hills. And it was, the most eye-opening experience for me. I thought I trained hard. <laughs> I trained hard and Jim was number one in the world at the time. So I learned so much. And, and then all of a sudden here I am competing and playing and practicing with these guys that I looked up to so much. And that was just, for me, it was just an amazing time. And, you know, we, like you said, Spokane, Washington, and, and later Colbert, Washington, even further outside of, um, you know, mainstream anything, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I grew up uh, on a ranch. I grew up a cowboy, not a, not a tennis player, you know. It, it, uh, so it was, uh, it was kind of amazing to be kind of thrust into the middle of it and, and then competing with them. And it was just, it, it was everything that I dreamed of, of, of doing is, you know, in, in my sport. Well, you not only competed with them, you, you also uh, came up on the good side against all those guys at least once. So that must have been unbelievable. Um, I know Steve remembers your 2000 Wimbledon quarterfinal run. I know you lost to Pete. Um, you beat some really good players there, including Leighton Hewitt. And as I was looking back at some of your results, you beat Leighton 
quite a few times over the course of your career. Um, was there something that you felt good when you when you saw Leighton across the the other side of the net? It was just a good matchup. Yeah, we, we, for you? I think we played. I think it was. Uh, we played like seven times, and I got him three. He got me four. I think. I, I remember most of those matches with Leighton because they were pretty intense ones. I I really liked Leighton. I liked him just fine off the court. I liked playing him. Other people, he would irritate because he was so kind of intense. But I was maybe more intense, equally intense, certainly. Um, so I loved that that dynamic of competing against this guy who just laid it all on the line, you know, heart on the sleeve, and and it, there was no mystery about Leighton Hewitt. He was going to compete his ass off the whole time till the last ball. And, and so was I. And so that was always an interesting matchup because I hit the ball harder than he did. He was a little more consistent than me, at least on the forehand side. And so, you know, going into that match, I knew if I hit my forehand well, I would beat him. If I made a lot of errors on the forehand side, he would probably beat me. So it was, it was sort of down to that. Um, really that simple. I felt like I had a little bit better backhand than he did. I could hit it harder, he could direct it well. So it was like there was some fun little dynamics in there that worked um, to make the matchup really fun. Um, there were some heartbreakers, and there was a couple that were that were awesome, you know, that, that, against him. But uh, I loved playing late. But Jan, Michael, you also had a pretty big serve, and it, it struck me that you could make Leighton a little uncomfortable because you, uh, you just mentioned the pace. You, you know, you could avoid getting into too many uh, excessively long rallies. And uh, do you think that bothered him as well? The combination of your serve, the power and breaking up his rhythm. Well, right. What the thing you had to do is break down his forehand, but you had to be able to stay with him on the backhand first. So you could break down the forehand a little bit later. It didn't break down early. Um, and yeah, I mean, I always sort of expected to get a few, a few free points on the, on the serve. I liked hitting aces. It's, it's, it's fun to hit aces. Everybody likes hitting aces. Um, so, you know, that was, that was in my favor. I could, I could definitely also attack his second serve and hurt him there so I could break it. Um, the thing about Leighton is he could break you because he would put a lot of balls back in play um, on both the forehand and the backhand. Some guys have a weakness. I wouldn't really say he had a weakness necessarily on the returns. He could, he could hit them and he could get them very deep. So I didn't, what I didn't like about that is if, if I didn't get a lot, a lot of first serves in and I'm hitting a lot of second serves, I had a, I had a good second serve. I don't think I had a great second serve. I think that's one thing that could have been better. Um, it, he could attack it a bit. And if he didn't attack it, it was just deep. And if you push me off the baseline, that's where I was not, you know, see these guys playing so far back these days. It's just unbelievable. I watch this. I, I do this for a living now is analyze what they're doing. And I'm like, how are these people playing so far back and being effective? Because it, there's no way I could have, the way I had the ball, done that. Um, so you pushed me off the baseline, and I was, I was, you know, a little bit less effective back there. You know, what do you, what, what ahead, do you Steve. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, David. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Steve. I was just going to say, what do you remember most about the quarterfinal against Pete at Wimbledon? I mean, everybody knew that he had hurt himself in the second round and, and wasn't practicing between matches, and there you are in the quarters. Right. You knew he wasn't necessarily going to be at his very best. But he, you weren't able to break him in four sets. Uh, you know, it was a tough match, no. you know. Yet you still won a set. Yeah, I did. I won that breaker. I, you know, I, it, was, it was very close. The interesting thing about, thing about that match, but it's, it's the way Pete always played. You know, even when, when I did beat him in Scottsdale, all the matches we played, uh, you know, we played a few, I think four or five. Um, he sort of plays Patsy from the baseline. Like he, he, his ground strokes, he would just miss, miss, miss. He'd go big, he'd, you know, hit, smack a couple forehands. They might be winners, they might not. As the set will go on, uh, he decides to start hitting those balls in the court. He'll chip the ball a little bit. He'll float a couple shots. He'll put a little more spin in the forehand. And before you know it, you're facing some break points. Uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was a very high-level trick. Because I walked out on the court thinking, if this guy beats me in a round stroke rally, I'm having a shitty day. Because I had no respect for his ground strokes from the baseline. I didn't think he could be in the baseline. It was, he couldn't, you know, if, if he went toe to toe, but that's not what Pete did. <laughs> he, he was smarter than everybody else, you know, pretty much would, would, would chip the ball, would float the ball. And then he would bring his targets in when it mattered at the end of sets. And that's exactly what happened at Wimbledon. I went through those service games easily, easily, easily until the end of each of those sets that I lost. And he chipped some balls back. And then you have to remember how good of a volleyer he was. So he gets forward to the net 
you, he, you could hit a great passing shot and he can make a volley off that. There's not many guys today that can volley like that. I mean, he, he could take it off of his shoelaces and surprise you. Um, so there was a bit of that that happened where he came in. Um, you know, he had a couple big shots from the baseline that I was surprised I didn't think he could do. That was my mistake to, to have that. You know, it's one thing to know that you can win against the guy from the baseline, that that's your, pro, that your, your whole plan is to win those rallies. Uh, it's another to sort of think that he won't, you know, change things. He's such a great champion. This is not some fool, you know? So um, th that's what, that's sort of what happened on my serve. Now on his serve, I had break points. I had plenty of those. And, and you know, some of them on second serves, I returned well that day. And the guy stepped up to the line in the ad court and nailed that tee, 115 plus, sometimes in the 120s. And what are you going to do about that? You know, <laughs> try to, you can try to take away the tee, but he's one of those guys. One of my favorite things to analyze is the big servers. You look at the, the best servers in the world. I still consider John the best server in the world. Nick Kyrgios is up there. Okulka is obviously up there because these guys hype. But it's who can hit the all the different spots on the big moments? Can you hit all four? Will you decide also to hit into the body to keep the guy honest? Can you, can you spin that serve and hit the serve flat out wide in the deuce? Um, you know, the ability to do those things. There's, there's good servers on the tour that, that have these sort of patterns built. They have great serves. But when it going gets tough, you can kind of hedge your bet a bit and move over and take that away from them. If you're a good returner, then you're going to put a ball back over the net and, and, it, and it's maybe it's even, maybe you have a shot at that at a, at a break or whatever it might be. With Pete, your guess is as good as mine as to where that ball is going to go. You just didn't know. Yeah, you give me nightmares right now. And Steve knows <laughs> this because I'm because i I'm a big Andre fan and I respect the hell out of Pete. I mean, I like them both, yeah. but I was, I, was a, I was an Andre fan. And what you said about playing Patsy in the early games of sets and then, you know, hitting 120 miles down the tee for on a second serve. Um, yeah, I'm flashback. So we're going to move on. It was amazing. One, he, would, he, he would do that to Andre too, you know? I know. <laughs> that whole thing came in. Uh, the, Andre Pete was always about depth for me. You know, who's going to win that battle? When Andre was getting the ball deep enough in the court on the ground, he's, he, was, he was beating Pete on those days, you know, because you, you knew he's going to always put some balls back and play. Not many people played Andre more than me. I know Pete did, but I played him 13 times and yeah. came up short 11 of those times. So um, he, he was, uh, you know, Andre is great, great for a whole different, a lot of different reasons. Yeah. No, it was a great rivalry. You're, um, and, and I know, and Steve knows this, but you won three titles. One is Scottsdale. And then the two is one of my favorite tournaments being a Chicago guy. I love going to Delray beach in February. And I know you won that tournament twice. Um, I don't know if the motivation was the car in the in the corner of the court, if they even had that still when you were playing in there. But um, that's such a fun tournament to, to go to and cover. It's a 250. It's really intimate. Um, you can get close to the players. You can get close to the coaches. It's right on right off Atlantic Avenue. So it's a great it's, mm -hmm. it's a great place to, you know, leave and come back, get, get something to eat and come back. Um, oh, it's an amazing tournament. I was there just this year. I played the, uh, the senior event played yep. again and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if that car was a Jaguar, if you know me well, I know I'm a huge British car fan, mostly Jags, <laughs> but uh, then I might have been even more fired up. I'd still be trying to play it. But um, uh, yeah, that event was so great. And it's so neat to see how the city of Del Rey has changed over the years. It's so much fun there. You can walk to those restaurants yeah. and there's just a lot to do. So it's that's one of the, my favorite events of the year. No, it's a great event. Um, I love covering it. The, the, the coaching part, and I know you work with Jared Donaldson for a while, and I know you coach other people as well, um, a lot of other people, but Jared, and it's such a shame that, that the injury bug caught him and he couldn't, you know, the knee was the, the main part of, of his issue, but um, how'd you kind of get into coaching after your playing days were over? Were you still kind of on tour near, near the latter days and helping others, maybe some younger kids out or uh, um, just something so like that happened in your lap? It sort of snowballed for me. I, you know, I was, I got injured. That's the only reason I had to stop playing. I would have played 10, 10 plus more years for sure. I didn't want to stop playing. I had really bad shin problems, which then transferred into hitting serve harder than I hurt my arm. My arm was bad for a couple of years. Um, so I was really kind of thrust off the tour. I didn't never by choice. So um, in, in sort of that space, I decided, you know, why don't we, I'm still able-bodied, have a, have a brain still. Why don't we start a, 
um, started a little academy. So with my dad and brother, we started an academy in Hawaii where I was, where, where I live. Um, and, you know, we started working with some, some sort of transition players, some juniors, high level juniors and, and pros transitioning to, you know, higher level pro tournaments, mostly challengers, some, some futures and, um, and that. And uh, then I tried again to start playing again. I said, you know, I, I would take some time off. My knees, shins would feel better. And then I would go out and play and they'd feel worse. And then I, it was a whole kind of a nasty process that wasn't, uh, wasn't great mentally to deal with. But uh, in the end, decided that you know, it wasn't going to happen for me. They never got better really until recently, which is weird. Um, uh, the first person I coached, uh, like actually on tour was Coco Vandeway, who's, who's one of my dearest friends. And uh, we sort of decided that it would be a good idea to, to try it out. We worked together for a couple of years and had a lot of great success. And uh, she's still, you know, very close to me. And you know, she's had injuries too that have been yeah. unfortunate, uh, but sort of started, you know, actual tour, back on tour travel. And I was glad that it was Coco because she's, A, she's been my good friend. B, it was the women's tour. So I could avoid seeing the men, which those are all the guys that I was playing. So it, was, it wasn't like much had changed. I wasn't enamored by the current guys on tour. So it was, it was a little bit hard for me to, to sort of see it. Um, and I was much happier to, to work with Coco and, and to sort of do something different, but be a part of the sport that I love. Um, mm -hmm. So that was the start. Got it. And then Jared, after, was Jared slightly after that? Jared wasn't directly after. I worked with a couple other juniors, worked with a couple other players. Um, and then, then Jared approached me at a USTA camp in Carson. And we had a good relationship on the court. Um, I think I said a few things to him that he really liked hearing. Um, I really thought that uh, the practices, one of the things I remember saying to him early was that these practices are for you and make it about you out here. You know, it's great. There's all these great players out here, but it's your practice. And um, I don't know if he'd heard that before. Um, and so I got along great with him and his dad, Courtney, and uh, who was, you know, involved. And, uh, you know, I, my dad coached me. And uh, so I know how sort of that situation is. Um, Courtney didn't really want to coach him, but wanted to be involved. And I, I welcomed that. I think some coaches try to get try to push the parents away, you know, in some situations that might work, you have to work with what is there. It's so important. Um, and I firmly believe that every player is needs to be coached a little bit differently. You know, you can't have this one way of doing things um, a, as a coach. And that's another thing they liked a lot. So you know, we did a lot of good, a lot of good. It was, we got him to 48 in the world. Yeah. Um, which was, which was a major accomplishment. He was on track with these guys, but with Rublevs and the Hatchinovs and, you know, the shop of olives and you know, Sissy Posse had to win over him. You know, he could, he could, he was with these guys and um, it does, it sucks that he hurt mm -hmm. his knee. And I was there it that sucks. day at Wimbledon when he, when he sort of took a step on the court and it was, it's like, oh, I hurt my knee a little bit. That feels really weird. You know, and then he still went out and ended up losing to Sissy Posse that, that year in the five sets. It was an amazing match to a break in the fifth, you know, right there, right there with them, you know, and yeah. And it still, uh, it still bothers him. It's still, the and he still bothers him. So Injuries are a killer, killer. Um, which, of, which of the roles? Do, which role do you enjoy more, the coaching or the commentary? Uh, which gives you the most satisfaction? You know what, Steve? It's, it's interesting. It's an interesting question. I thought a lot about that. I did more of the coaching first. I was doing some commentary with me in sports. I was working the Doha event, a few other events, um, doing um, some world feed stuff uh, as well. So I was sort of getting my, you know, my hands wet with that, my feet wet, I should say, um, with the commentary. I like it for different reasons. It, it's really fun to, to help a young player coming up and see them realize something and, and sort of take the expertise and all this travel and all this stuff that I've done and play and, and sort of help them. And it's really cool when you see this aha moment where you say something that just kind of gets across or you come up with a strategy that just works. And they said, man, I went out there and did, did it and it worked so well. That is, that is really rewarding to kind of analyze. I like that. So, but that sort of comes directly from being able to analyze it. So, you know, taking that ability and, and, and watching, you know, players play and, and, you know, breaking it down for, for viewers, it has been really fun for me as well. And I get to be me. I get to get to step into my own shoes. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's my opinion. One of the greatest things about tennis channel is, is you just have an opinion. 
you know, have an opinion and, and you know, don't be a dick, you know, <laughs> but, you know, have it, have an opinion. And, and you know, I, I like to analyze in a positive way. I think that, you know, players try so hard, almost every single one of them tries so hard on the court. And I don't like to dog players. You know, you can, you can call things out that, you know, that's a silly shot or you can, you can say things that, you know, let the viewer say, Oh, you know, this, that's a player that probably tried that a thousand times, did it 999, you know, missed that one, you know, and talk about why they might miss it, you know, the pressure, whatever the moment might be. Um, so that, that's fun for me to, to really do the analysis. I've been getting into some hosting as well. So that's, it's, that's some, it's a way for me to sort of grow. And, and the hosting is something I never thought of doing necessarily, but I really enjoy it. So you know, there's just two seats to fill there. Sometimes we do the solo calls. We've been doing them this week, which is um, a lot of fun. And it, it pushes me. It pushes me to, to, to be more and to do more and to learn. So that's, that's exciting. Um, and coaching, you take, take a step back. It's about the player. It needs to be. At least if you, know, if you have a half a brain as a coach, it needs to be about making that player better. Um, so, you know, all in all, I think that, you know, I'm a little envious. Paul Anthony gets to do a little bit of both all the time, you know, <laughs> working with Taylor Fritz. Um, but a guy like that, that's really, that's an exciting kind of alluring idea because they really work well together. If you, if you can, you know, you talked about Renee Stubbs, she's been fantastic with both the commentary and, and the coaching and does a little bit of both and you stay active. And the idea has to be though, that you continue, you're, you're learning every time. I'm learning every time I sit down in the chair to watch a match. I learned quite a bit this week, you know, about some players that I hadn't seen in the qualifying. That's exciting for me. Um, you know, every time you walk out on the court, hopefully when you're coaching somebody, you're, you're, you're learning something or at least trying to help them, them learn something. So that's, that's rewarding. Now, do you, speaking of learning, I well remember your father out there in the tour with you. And I, I assume that you got a great deal of your intensity from him. I, I, the mm -hmm. feeling I always had was, that, you know, he, he was deeply involved and you respected him and that he rubbed off on you. Did his coaching rub off on you? That's a very good question, Steve. Uh, you know, it's interesting. He, my dad made no bones about the way he coached me. It wasn't a mystery. <laughs> you know, he, he coached me like a, like a football player and a wrestler. That's what he knew. That's what he grew up with. Um, his dad passed away early. So he was, you know, learning a little bit along the way as well. I think um, he yelled a lot. He cussed <laughs> a lot and, and it never bothered me. Sometimes I yelled back. It was a dynamic that's, that's it's, it's interesting one. When you, it, even now in life, if somebody yells at me, I tune in rather than kind of get taken a box. I'm, I'm not, it doesn't bother me to be yelled at. I, I react positively to being yelled at, which is very strange. You know, it might be just that it was maybe the relationship we had as a, you know, he didn't do that off the court. It was just the way that he coached me. And it sort of, of course, tennis is, is eternal. You're always talking about it at all the meals and all the time. So you, you, you would, you know, it kind of rubs off, I guess a little, but that's just the way that it worked for us. Um, your question, getting back to that, it's interesting. It, it did affect me because when I first working, started working with Coco, I think she, you know, I thought she needed to be pushed, maybe yelled. I don't like the word yelling, but the, you have to be intense with Coco. Uh, she responds very well to that. Um, because I care about her so, so much, it was hard for me to, to, to do that. Um, and that's one of the things that I think that our, our relationship, when it ended, it was, it fell short a little bit. I didn't want to be that with Coco. You know, I, I, I didn't, it, it just, I, I think I knew that it, she probably needed it. She reacts. She's very much like me. I think one of the, we're such good friends. Uh, um, her mom's pretty intense, wonderful. Um, Tana is a wonderful person, but it, intense like that. And, you know, and that's fine. You know, it, it worked. Boy, she's achieved a lot. But I, I don't think that it was me that needed to be there doing that. I think, I think Craig Carden and Pat Cash sort of done a little bit better job with that as far as just sort of being in her face a little bit. Um, then, you, you know, you move on to... Jared Donaldson, and he, he didn't react very well at all to being yelled at. So with Jared, it was, how do I find a way to, to get through to him? Um, he gets very intense, but if I approached him with intensity, he would back away and, and it, was, it, was, it was totally counterproductive. So with him, it was, how can I be positive? How can I, how can I say something that would be in a positive way that would be helpful? 
you know, things like, oh, that was the that was a great toss. That's that's right where we want to have it. Or great forehand. Oh, that was a really good time to change direction. You know, or that's that's the height on the net that we're looking for on on the back end. For, you know, that far back from behind the baseline. You know, whatever it might be. That's one of the fun things, just finding figuring that out. Um, done some work with Ernesto Escobedo, a uh, wonderful yes, player. I remember talking to you on the phone once when you were working with him. Talk a, talk yeah. a little bit. He seems like such a nice kid. He's a wonderful human being. Ernesto, I think the world of him, he, he's almost sometimes too nice. <laughs> sometimes you need to be a little bit meaner to get through some of these matches and put guys away. Um, Ernesto, I could yell at him all day long, and he would, he would react in the most positive way. He would, I could tell him, you need to run through that wall. You need to run through that wall again. And he would, you know, he would, he would do it. And, you know, that would, because if he puts his belief in you, he, that, that's that, you know? So that's the fun thing about, about coaching is sort of figuring that out is, is how do you get through to these different players, you know, on a level that's truly going to help them. And it, it does take a bit of time to sort of figure that out. Figure it out, yeah. I remember you were with Ernesto and Winneka at that Winneka Challenger a couple of years mm. ago. Um, yeah. That was before, I think it was 2019. It was the year before COVID, I think. 18 before or 19. The, the years are starting to run, <laughs> years are starting <laughs> to run into each other. But I, I know it, I know it's it's late. Um, and we appreciate you, you taking the time to talk with us. You're doing an awesome job and everything you're doing in the sport of tennis, like we said, with Thank the SoCal, you. the new SoCal pro circuit, the coaching, the broadcasting, you're doing it all. You're doing a great job. Um, I, before we leave, I, because the draw uh, came out earlier today, I have to ask you just your brief thoughts, um, especially on the men's side, that top, the top half of the draw, you got Novak, Rafa, Zverev, and Alcaraz, unfortunately, all in that top half. Uh, any brief thoughts you want to give before uh, live coverage? I'll try to be brief, but I do have a couple of thoughts. First of all, I, I'm very pro. I know there, there was a little bit of talk a few years ago. It's probably not, never going to happen, but I liked it better when there were 16 seeds. I think 32 seeds is is too many. I think it makes the first rounds a little bit easier for the top guys and girls on on, on you know on the tour, which is fine. Tournament directors, even the slams, like to see the main the top players get through the draws. I don't think they should have two matches where it makes them feel really comfortable, you know, every single slam. <laughs> I, I think that that's, that's very helpful, you know? Um, but when you, when you had 16 seeds and you see Pete both won most of his slams at 16 seeds, you know, you could possibly play as the number one player in the world, the guy who's 17, 18, the 20th player in the world. Those are the players that sort of believe they can win against against a top person like that. When you get outside the top 32, these are players that are sort of enamored by these top players. So it's it's different. It's just different. So that's one thought that I that I have, and that's maybe a whole different topic to talk about another time. But um, I love this draw. I love the upper half. Sorry, I, I love the upsets. I love seeing a little bit of chaos. I'm tired of seeing the same people get through these events. It's it's tired for me. Let's see some new winners. I, I, I love seeing Shiantek come out of nowhere. You know, you have the women's tour has been fantastic. And you have all these different players winning. And, you know, can Kaichikova find a way to do it again? I don't know. She hasn't played. So, you know, it, but that top half for me is, it's awesome. <laughs> what, what are your thoughts, Too bad. Though? We're not going to have the same people in the final. But, Jan Michael, what are your thoughts about the fact that you got a 13-time champion? who happens to have some uh, injury problems recently and therefore is down to five in the seedings. To me, there's an injustice there. The Rafa, you know, that's where I think a seeding should be more of a projection. You get back to your thoughts on 16 seeds versus 32. To me, you have to take that into account. And to me, for Rafa not to be a top four seed is, is not right. Your yeah, thoughts? Steve, I think that's, that's okay, interesting. But the French has never done that. True, true. If it was Wimby, if it was Wimby, he would be top four seed. He'd probably yeah. be seeded number two. They'd probably move him up there. You know, if, after all that he's done, he'd probably even, he, you know, it, do, do you, would you, would you want them to change it just on that, that one principle this year? Well, no, I, I would want them to change it. Well, that one principle. Yeah. I just feel like, again, even with Carlos, as you said, he's been over the recent months, the best player in the world. He's won two events on clay. I, I think that has to be taken into account versus 12 months. So therefore, I like the idea that you would have had Alcarez and Nadal both up in the top four with Djokovic. 
and probably right. sits and that would be your top four and the others five through eight it's fine so i would make more than the just the one change with rafa i would have also moved carlos up but as you yeah. say they don't like, they don't like to do that it's interesting because well then all the other slams have to do the same so right then you have to take they have to agree with the open and the yeah. australian open yeah, Wimbledon already does already does it famously does it, and it's already it's always something that everybody talks about every year. Is oh, Wimbledon did this, and Wimbledon did that, but they've they've done it. They do things their own way. Um, I don't really have a problem with 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 the Slams doing that. I never did at Wimbledon. I was I actually got moved up a couple times, seated, so I was all excited about that. Uh, with my grass results, it didn't help me, but. Uh, but they have to all do it, I think. If, yeah. if the French does it, would, would do it this year, then they have to do it in, in subsequent years as well. Yeah. And also, again, with Rafa's, Rafa's special, Rafa's the king. You know, with Rafa, if they fudge that, that seating a bit, I probably would have much of a problem with it. It would be talked about. With Alcaraz, he hasn't proved himself at the French yet. Yeah. And, you know, he played well at the US Open. Right, so he he definitely can play three out of five. Did, did he get a little tired in that tournament? Maybe. So you, you know, there's some things to think about there. He, he didn't get tired um, in Madrid. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, this will be interesting. This so, I'll, I'll say this. This will be interesting. And I know I know Novak beat Rafa last year at the French, but you know the general thing you say with your friends is, do you want Rafa or do you want the field? And it's really not the field like golf. In golf, you have to beat everybody else who's playing. In tennis, it's not really the field. It's the seven guys who Rafa would play. Right. So you always take the bet of, do you take Rafa or do you take the seven guys that he'll face? But this, especially with the foot, especially with the foot, I think this coming up tournament is the first time, and it's always scary to bet against greatness, but <laughs> if you were to put your life on it, you pick Rafa or the seven guys he may have to face it's not as easy as a decision of just picking Rafa like it may have been the last, what, 13 no. out of 15 years he played or whatever it is. Well, I picked, I picked the field in Australia, and look where that – I mean, I didn't think that Rafa was going to win the Australian Open. I mean, right. the guy right. came out and won every single hard court match on the road. So Unbelievable. You know, Miami – I mean, just unbe unbelievable. Or Indian Wells. I mean, unbelievable, you know. Uh, but this foot injury was closer foot to, to the bad. French than what his foot injury was in the summer what it was to Australia, so – Right. So, so that's tricky. I think it's, I, I, for me now, I think it's, it's more of that. I, I was so inspired by what Rafa did in the Australian Open because nobody expected him to win the tournament, or at least I did. Maybe some people did, but on hard courts, I didn't, I didn't think it was going to be him. And there he was, you know, going through everybody. And that was exciting for me. Midway through all the French Open championships that he's won there, I kind of got bored a little bit. Now it's, that takes nothing away from how good he is, how great of a champion, you know, all that. It's amazing. But kind of like for me, I'd be like, okay, I'm probably going to turn this off. I don't need to see him win it again. But now, now, if he wins it with this foot injury and, you know, getting a little bit older, to me, that's, that's a little bit more exciting. That's, that's this heart of the champion. That, that reminds me of Connors, that, that who's my hero, you know, so that's, it's exciting. I, I yeah, it's, it's, it's a tough upper draw. How <laughs> Jan Michael, how would you call it right now? I mean, pick the winner of Novak versus Rafa, and then who beat, and then assume Carlos does make that semi, he does beat Zarev. Who wins the match between either Djokovic or Nadal versus Alcaraz? <laughs> I think that the tennis that Novak played in Rome, if he gets there, I think he'll beat Rafa again. I think he can do it in that, that, that lengthy of a, of a situation. I think he might get through it. You know, that being said, if he then would face Alcaraz, it depends on how much tennis Alcaraz plays. It sort of depends on all that, those things. It, this, you know, Djokovic has this, this way of getting through these tough, long matches that just, it's just mind boggling. Even, even his last year's final, I mean, it's just, I mean, how does he win that? I mean, how does he, how does he have like a, this, this, his second, you know, you have a second win. There's all this second win. The second win's going to come. And when's it going to come? When's it going to come for him? It's like, He's like a second and a third wind and matches, and it's just raises the level of his game. You know, as much as I would love to see Alcaraz come through and win it, because you know, I love the idea of a new young champion, um, it would be good for our sport. I, I think it's going to be really hard to beat Novak. Yeah, uh, I think a lot of people may agree with you on that one, Jan Michael. 
Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate your time tonight and, and have fun calling the matches. It's going to be a heck of a Absolutely. couple of weeks. It sure is. Enjoy the tournament. Thank yeah, you. Thank yes, we, we enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.